Well, what's up, everybody? Are we good? Come on, are we good? No, you need to do better than that. Is God good? Come on. If we're going to get excited, let's get excited. Man, uh, I'm excited to be here. We are now uh, closing off this teaching series called Storytellers. It's been really, really powerful. Uh, we actually do this every single year. We'll highlight a couple of powerful testimonies in our church family, real people, real stories, real hope. And Jesus really said it this way, that they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their what? Come on, shout it out like you mean it, say testimony. Listen, our testimonies are really, really powerful. And they're powerful because when we testify of the goodness of God, the power of God gets released over the people. And here's what people think, man, if God could do it in that person's life, then God can do it in my life. And if you're believing with me today that God's gonna bring breakthrough like only he can, here's a great time to give him some praise. Come on. Chris Duke, can you bring my mic down just a little bit because I'm going to shout today in Jesus' name. Listen, before we dive into the message, I want to direct us to something that is really, really dear to my heart. And if this is a part of, of the family of faith that you belong to, if Vertical Chapel is home for you, I want this to be an important part of your heart too. We're doing something called Serve Day. Come on, say Serve Day. I want you to repeat this after me. Say Saturday. July 13th, I want you to get it on your calendar. This is where we get outside of the walls of Vertical Chapel and we actually be the church, the hands and feet of Jesus and we love a broken community, not just serve them but to serve them in the name of the Lord. If you're with me, say amen. This is not just a vertical thing. Notice this, 930 churches, six continents, 26 countries, and 50 states. This is something that we are partnering with the body of Christ at large. And uh, I want you to get it on your calendar. I want you to plan your summer vacation around it because it's one thing to invite people to church. It's another thing to be the church and to go outside of these walls and to love people the way Jesus loved people. And if you think that's a good idea, shout out, amen. Listen, I want you to know there's going to be 15 projects that we are setting up through Vertical, 15 projects. They all vary. Some of them are yard work. Some are construction projects, uh, assembling wheelchair ramps for homes. There's going to be a group of people who are going to go prayer walk, and uh, we're going to go saturate prayer over a couple of communities believing God for revival. Is anybody still believing God for revival? And then we're going to collect some non-perishable food items. There's a lot more there, but I just want you to get it on your calendar. And I want to let you know of something that the Association of Related Churches, this is the church planning ministry we're a part of, and then specifically Church of the Highlands, they are making an app available. And so Vertical will have access to this app. And it's not just got, it won't just have the things that we're going to be doing, but notice this, it'll actually show the progress of each project. So as we're doing work, as we're serving that Saturday, your group may be actually completed, but you could go on to the app and see, well, you know what? The middle school still needs more help. So we're going to send a group of people over there so that we can continue with the projects that God has outlined for us. So all that to say, signups will begin on June 1st, June 1st. And so there will be a website launch. The app will be available to download. It's all free but we want you to make it a priority, okay? I want you to fist bump now the person next to you and just say, you need to look alive today. Come on, tell them, you need to look alive today. Listen, I want you to fist bump the other person on the other side of you, the one you're not bold enough to say they didn't sing well during worship, but just tell them, you really need to wake up. Come on, you really need to wake up. Well, today... Uh, we're going to talk about a topic that is very dear to my heart. There are a few topics as a pastor that I get really fired up about, 
And I believe that this is one of those topics because God spoke a prophetic word over my life when I was seeking him with regards to vertical. And God spoke this word that vertical chapel will be grace to be a family church. And it's not just because we have a lot of kids. Uh, We do have a lot of kids and I'm grateful for that. But God said, no, I'm going to help you be a church that equips parents to raise spiritual champions, but also a church that sees broken marriages restored in the name of Jesus. Amen? And we have seen it time and time again. Elisa and I have seen the power of God move in broken relationships, and I'm just believing that God is going to do that today. Are you with me? I love this. Attending a wedding for the first time, a little girl whispered to her mother, why is the bride dressed in white? And the mother replied, because White is the color of happiness, and today is the happiest day of her life. And the little girl thought for a minute and then asked, so why is the groom wearing black? Come on, somebody. <laughs> now that is funny right there. Here, here, here's, here's what I want you to know. Whether you are married or you are single, uh, whether your marriage is healthy or whether it is broken, whether you would say we've got room to grow or we are in crisis mode. Maybe you're single and available and don't worry, there will be a part in the service that I'll ask all the God-fearing people who are single to put up their hand and you get to take first pick. Come on, somebody. Uh, we, we, won't, we won't do that. We won't do that. We're not that kind of church. Come on. But listen, regardless of where you are, Uh, Maybe you're not even married, but one day you want to be married. These things that we talk about today, you need to know because they're going to equip you. They're going to help you to navigate some of the difficulties of marriage that Hollywood does not let on, that Hollywood does not teach us. So here's the first thing I want you to write down, that marriage takes hard work. Come on, say hard work. No, no, no. Say it like you mean it. Say hard work. I mean, you know, you didn't need to come to church today. If you're married, you didn't need to come to church today to know that marriage takes hard work, that that's not a revolutionary point. But I'm telling you, it does take hard work, but God is faithful. God will do the heavy lifting for you if you will simply trust God. I need a better amen. I love how Paul says this in Ephesians chapter six. He's not even referring to marriage, but we can use marriage as the filter to understand what Paul is saying starting in verse 12. Paul says it this way, for our struggle, come on, say struggle. That, that word means battle, our resistance, our relational conflict, our struggle is not against, come on, say it with me, flesh and blood. Stop there for a second. It's not against your spouse. It's not against your boss. It's not against the coworker at work or the mean teenager at school. That is not ultimately who your enemy is, but you do have an enemy. He says this, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. He's saying, look it, there is a spiritual war happening all around you and darkness is at conflict with light all around around you in every relationship. And Paul's saying, it is very, very important, listen to me, that you don't fight the wrong person. Because let me tell you what ministry experience has taught Elisa and I. Here it is. Not that husband and wife aren't fighting, but husband and wife are fighting the wrong enemy. And we see it over and over again. And so Paul is like, I'm trying to get your eyes off of the things of this world to realize there is a spiritual war that is happening all around you. And it involves people, but your enemy is not people. Can I get a better amen? So he says, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, what day? Come on, somebody say today. That the day of evil is today, that you may be able to stand. Come on, say stand. You may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything you can do by the power of the Holy Spirit to stand. Let me tell you, why would Paul tell you to stand? Let me say it another way. 
Paul would never tell you to do something that you are incapable of doing. He says that you've got to get your armor on. You're in a spiritual war. The good news is you can stand firm. Why can I stand firm? Not because I'm good, not because I'm strong, not because I have it all together for one reason alone. Jesus is my foundation and Jesus is unshakable. So it doesn't matter the war that's happening all around me. The emphasis is not the battle. The emphasis is my foundation. Jesus is my foundation. As long as Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he does not shift like shifting shadows, he is faithful in all of his ways. He'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. He'll give grace abound to me so that in all things, at all times, having all that I need, I will abound in every good work. There isn't a weapon in all of hell that can prosper against what God is building in my home. Why? Because my foundation is stable. Because my foundation is stable. I think a lot of people love the idea of marriage. They just don't like the hard work that it requires. And this is the culture that we live in. I found these on Google because every good sermon involves things on Google. Check this one out. Being married is like having a best friend who doesn't remember anything you say. Come on, somebody. Well, what about this next one? Marriage is a relationship in which one person is always right and the other person is the husband. (laughs) And all the husbands, you didn't say anything because you don't want to get in trouble. Look at this next one. Marriage, promising to put up with each other's annoying habits forever. Now listen to me. Don't act all spiritual in here. You know you just got in an argument in the car on the way and then you stepped into vertical and said, I'm blessed and highly favored. I'm too blessed to be stressed. Come on, somebody. I know you know the Christian needs. Look at this one. Hun, I know where we keep everything in the house. I live here too. Remember? Said no husband ever. Come on. What about this one? If I cry at our wedding, it's only because I'll be overjoyed that the planning of our wedding is finally over and all the bride said amen. Here's the best one. Every day I fall more in love. I fall in love with you more and more, except yesterday. Yesterday, you were pretty annoying. Come on, somebody. Listen, we can, we can all relate to that. And I need you to get this, church. I, I need you to hear it. Write it down. Your marriage is under attack. I'm going to say it again. The enemy hates your marriage. He hates your marriage. Why? Because marriage is the thread that holds the fabric of society together. If you have unhealthy marriages, you have an unhealthy church. If you have an unhealthy church, you have an unhealthy society. So if he's going to attack, he's going to attack the place where he can create the most amount of damage. Here's the second thing, write it down. Your spouse is not your enemy. Your spouse is not your enemy. You may be at conflict with your spouse, but make no mistake about it, there is a spiritual enemy that is working behind the scenes to help create that conflict. And I remember... Um, one day, Elisa and I, we were in the bedroom having a discussion. That's what we call arguments. Come on, somebody, discussions. We love to say that. Oh, we were just having a discussion. Come on. And uh, we hear on the door, mom, dad, mom, dad, mom, mom, dad. We boom, open up the door. What's going on? And there's our three kids right in front of the door. And, and Leighton goes, dad, 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 listen, Lola took her block book And she was playing around with it, and she threw it into the screen of the TV. And Daddy Bear comes out of that room. I don't care how cute she is. She's going to get a spanking in Jesus' name. I'm like, what? And, And I'm looking for this little girl. And London, the one that is more honest in the moment, she sees my face. She's freaking out. She's like, she didn't do it. I said, what do you mean she, she didn't do it? She looks over at Leighton. She looks back at me. I said, tell me the truth. She says, well, Leighton said that we should blame it on Lola, but he's the really one, one that really did it. And he said, we should blame Lola because she is too cute to be spanked. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and I'm sitting there like, 
I'm about to spank the wrong kid. You all getting spankings in Jesus' name. Listen, it's funny, okay? But I wonder if we were honest. We would say so much of the time in the context of our marriage, we are spanking the wrong person. Yeah. We're focused on the wrong person. And I want you to write this down. What do you do when you're in, the, in that place where there is conflict? You're in the place where there's conflict. Conflict. I want you to write down these three things. Here's the first one. Stop making excuses. Stop making excuses excuses. You've got to embrace the process. I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. He says, therefore, dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Come on, say stand firm. Stand firm. No, no, say it like you mean it, like you're excited to be in church today. Come on, say stand firm. Let nothing move you. You don't have to repeat me everything. Thanks, Meredith. It was good though. Um, Listen, let nothing move you. Now notice this next thing. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Stop there. What if we took that seriously? What if in the context of our marriage, we gave ourselves fully to the work of God in our marriage? Because you know what? It's easy to give yourself when things are easy. It's a lot harder to give yourself when your spouse is ticking you off and you feel like she or he doesn't deserve it. And the question is, listen to me, are you making excuses or are you stepping in to what God has called you to do? Give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor is not in vain. If you're there, come on, shout out amen if you believe that. Listen, people love the idea of marriage. They just hate the idea of the process of working on their marriage. Here's the second thing you need to do. You need to stop deflecting the blame. Oh, come on, this is better than what you're saying. You need to stop. Listen, how, how often, like Elisa and I, we, we think about this sometimes. We have counseled a lot of people at our dinner table who are going through marital, marital difficulty, and it was so amazing that so much of the time people get to our table and what they're fighting over, what, what there is a crisis over, we're sitting there going, man, that's silly. Like, is, is that it? I'm like, yeah, can you believe it? I'm like, I really can't, because that's really, I can't believe you guys haven't talked to each other for two weeks because you're mad about who didn't wash the dishes or you're mad about, listen, listen to me. Can can we just get honest for a second? Church, look at me. If we assessed what we typically argue over with our spouse, I think we would step back and go, it really isn't that big of a deal. Now, sometimes it is a big deal and there's a ton of hurt and a ton of brokenness. Can I get an amen? But I see, I see husbands and wives going, I'm not gonna give in first. I'm not gonna apologize. I'm waiting for them to apologize. I, I'm not gonna forgive. I'm waiting for an apology. Can I just tell you, you don't need an apology to forgive someone. If you've experienced the love of Jesus Christ, then you have an agape love, an unconditional love, and you can do things that seem impossible because Jesus can do the impossible. But so often the times we're, we're pointing the blame back. Yeah, but she did. Yeah, 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 but he did. The Bible says that love keeps no records of wrongs. Come on, we love, to, we love to read it at a wedding. Come on, somebody. We just don't like to live it in marriage. Here's the third one. Stop believing Hollywood. You realize the notebook isn't real, right? Like you, you realize that they invested billions of dollars to portray a reality that is actually a lie. 
And so often we sit in our brokenness and we're, com- we're comparing our brokenness to what everybody else puts on Instagram, what everybody else puts on Facebook, and we say things like this, I wish our marriage was like that. Well, do you know why your marriage isn't like that? Because that isn't real. Man, I wish my husband did what that husband does for his wife. Man, I, I wish my wife was more understanding, was more joyful, and it's so easy, and you're so consumed with something that is not real. Look at me, at the expense of what could be beautiful in your marriage, what could be a blessing in your marriage, what could release the blessing of God and the favor of God in your marriage. Look at me, you've got to stop looking at everybody else's highlight reel because it's not true. It's not true. Can I tell you why comparison is so bad? Because comparison will bring one of two outcomes. Either you will look at somebody and you'll go, man, I'm doing way better than I thought, which is pride. Listen. Or you'll look at somebody and go, man, we we stink. Man, I'm a failure. Can I just propose to you? God doesn't want either one of those outcomes for you. God's got blessing for you. But so often we're spending our time fighting our spouse. Here's what I know, that you can't fight for your marriage while you're fighting against your spouse. You cannot fight for your marriage while you're fighting against your spouse. Can I get an amen? Amen. Here's the second thing. Marriage takes total surrender. Marriage takes total surrender. here's, Here's what I mean by that. You don't have a marriage issue you have a heart issue. Here's why I know. Because God created marriage. And what God creates, it's good. There is no problem with what God has created. When does it become a problem? When we jack up what he created. Come on, somebody. And this is oftentimes what happens. People will go to counselors. People will go to pastors. And they'll say, look, we've got a marriage problem. Can you please fix it? Like I've got a magic wand, come on somebody. And so Elisa and I will say, look at me, you don't have a marriage problem. You have a following Jesus problem. Because if you're following Jesus, guess what? You can forgive. If if you're following Jesus, then you can love people even when you don't feel like loving them. If you're following Jesus, then the blessing of God is just an outflow of following Jesus. There is nothing wrong with marriage. The only thing that is wrong is when we misuse this gift called marriage. But we don't like to hear that. Can I get a better amen? Look at this. Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything. Come on, say everything. Listen, in the Hebrew, everything, or in the Greek, everything means everything, not some things, everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. How do we do it? By fixing our eyes on Jesus who is the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Let me tell you what the author is saying. Only Jesus had the authority to begin a good work in you. Only Jesus has the authority to bring it to completion. He says, but you are running a race. And the great cloud of witnesses simply just represents the people who have gone on to heaven before us. So in heaven, imagine this. There is this grandstand, and they're doing two things. All of the saints, they are praising God, and they are cheering you on. Keep running the race. Keep running the race. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep pursuing the Lord. Keep laying your marriage down at the altar of Jesus. Just keep running the race over and over again. Why? Because they know the faithfulness of God. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, now here's the application. You've got to do some heart surgery. You've got to throw off anything that hinders and anything that would entangle you, that sin, that brokenness. Come on, say, we're running a race. Can I propose to you, you cannot run a race if you're bogged down with the weight of sin. And so often, look at me, we're so focused at the, of the sin of our spouse But when is the last time that you said to God, God, deal with the sin in my life? When is the last time that you called sin, sin and not a mistake? Oh, we love mistake. Okay, I made a mistake. Come on. No, you didn't. You sinned. Come on, somebody. You sinned. It's sin. 
Sin is, means to miss the mark. When is the last time that you said, God, deal with the sin in my life? Because that language hinders and entangles. Can I give you the best translation that I can? Prevents progress. We're called to run a race, but my progress is prevented. Why? Because I'm weighted down. Like, look at this one. Because of porn. Pornography. Listen to me. This is one that is breaking the church today. It is breaking marriages today. And I'm going to confess something at the end of this message. But can I tell you that pornography will awaken and enslave you to an appetite and a standard that your spouse cannot fulfill. See, I didn't know about pornography when I was younger. I was exposed to it, but nobody ever told me the truth. Nobody ever told me you'll become a slave to it. Nobody ever told me that it won't be, that, it, that it'll be easy or it won't, it'll be incredibly difficult to walk away from it. And so many men, listen to me, men, I love you enough to say it. Pursuing pornography will not make your marriage better. And it will not be a substitution for the lack of physical intimacy with your wife. It is a trap of the enemy. And he knows that it will enslave you to a standard and to an appetite that cannot be fulfilled by your spouse. What about this next one? Addiction. Come on, we all got different addictions, which leads to a bondage that no spouse can fix. What about affirmation? See, affirmation sounds like a good thing. Listen, we all need to be affirmed. You ever notice that when we stand face to face with Jesus, he's going to affirm us, well done, good and faithful servant? It's not bad to be affirmed, but you got to make sure that you're not trying to receive something from your spouse that they were not created to fulfill. Because there is a level of affirmation that only God can satisfy in your life. And if you are looking to your spouse to fulfill you at your deepest level, you will never be fulfilled. You will be frustrated and you will be weighted down. What about this next one? Resentment. Uh, 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 unforgiveness. Listen, resentment will hurt you more than your spouse. It becomes a prison. What about overworking? Oh, I'm just going there today. Can I just go there today? Is that okay? What about overworking? Can, can I tell you, one of the things that when I meet with men, I realize that most men don't overwork because they have to. They overwork because they don't want to deal with the brokenness at home. And it becomes a, a just fantasy, just an escape. And here's what I need you to write down, that the condition of your soul determines the condition of your marriage. The condition of your soul, the condition of your walk with God. Why? Because everything is an outflow of your walk with God. When my walk with God is healthy, guess what? My marriage is going to get healthy. When my walk with God is not healthy or is absent or distant, guess what? I'm going to face the difficulties of darkness in my life. Come on, how many, you know, we just got to get real. Church, I just really feel it in this service even more than the first one. We got to get real. We got to get real. We just got to get real. I, I, need a, I need an amen. amen. Tom and Sarah just celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. And Sarah asked Tom, do you want to go upstairs? And you know. And Tom replied, well, you're going to need to pick one because I don't have the energy for both. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Some of you are still trying to catch up. All right, listen, Tom was getting real. I don't have the energy for both. Look at David, and David is my hero. David, 139, 23 through 24, search me. Come on, say search me. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart and try me. Test my thoughts and see if there's any grievous ways. Come on, say grievous way. See, that's an interesting language because Paul says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. God, see if there's anything in me that grieves your heart. Now David gets really dangerous. And whatever you find, lead me in the way of everlasting. Can I tell you 
what David was saying to God? Whatever you expose, that's not of you in my life. My answer is yes, I'm gonna walk in obedience. And can I tell you why a lot of people don't get set free? Because they confess sin, but they don't renounce it. There is a difference between confessing sin and renouncing sin. Confessing sin is acknowledging that sin is there. Renouncing it is, a, is an act of repentance. I am turning from it and I'm turning to God. That used to satisfy me, but it didn't last. Guess what? I'm turning to Jesus and he's gonna satisfy me and that satisfaction lasts forever. This is the God we serve. But on this race, there are a whole bunch of landmines. Come on, say landmines. They're, they're all over the place. And, and we've got to learn how, how to navigate the landmines in the context of marriage. Some of those landmines are bad decisions that you make. Some of those landmines are bad decisions that other people made. So some of those landmines are decisions that nobody made. They're just part of living in a broken world that is full of sin. But regardless, they're out there and we're running this race in the context of marriage and we've got to know what the landmines are and how to navigate them. Write down the first landmine, unrealistic expectations. Here's an unrealistic expectation. My spouse was created to make me happy. No, your spouse was created to be your helpmate. And those are not the same things. I felt the Holy Spirit told me to say this earlier this morning. I'm gonna say it again this time. Look at me. Husbands, it is unrealistic to get married and expect physical intimacy every day. Shocker. Come on, somebody. Okay, listen to me. Wives, it is unrealistic and unfair to use sex as a weapon yeah. or a punishment. It is unrealistic to use physical intimacy as a weapon that says, I'm not going to do that until this begins to happen. Listen, I need you to understand Sex, 90% is spiritual, not physical. Teenagers, please hear me. I need you to hear me. That God created sex as a gift. And it is a good thing and it is a pure thing. But he created boundaries for that gift. And if you operate within the boundaries, which is one man, one woman, in the context of marriage, which is an eternal covenant between man, woman, and God, if you operate in sex within God's framework, his plan, you'll get to experience his blessing. And God will pour out favor on you. But when you step beyond that barrier and you say, I'm gonna investigate and I'm going to explore, I promise you, it's gonna have consequences that won't just affect you, it will have consequences that are gonna affect your future spouse. Right. And it will be things that you pass down to your kids. You have to understand that physical intimacy is for spiritual. And it's so important that we get that. What about this next one, unaddressed sin? Come on, we've been talking about it. Let me ask you a question. Is there any unaddressed sin in your life? How about this one? Unhealthy boundaries. Oh, come on, man, look at me. If you cannot talk to that coworker of the opposite sex without flirting, then you need to cut off that conversation. Women, if you like to have a conversation with a man, with a, with a man because you feel like they give you the affection that you're craving, you need to cut that off. That is an unhealthy boundary. That is a landmine and nothing good will ever come from it, ever. Nothing good will ever come from it. Let me give you another unhealthy boundary. Hear me out, parents, when you put your kids above your marriage. When your children become a bigger priority than your marriage, you are outside of God's covenant design and God will never bless it. And I need you to think even deeper your kids will actually have to 
carry the consequences of a lack of biblical order in your home. Here's why I know it's true. Because I cannot parent my kids well unless Lisa and I are in unity. It is in unity that God commands the blessing. So if I elevate my kids above my marriage, then I am choosing to operate without the blessing of God. And we've got to realize that. See, nobody wants to talk about this. The church doesn't want to talk about this. But can we come into agreement that we need to talk about it, that God is good, his way is the best way, he gives life to every dead place in our lives? And here's the last one, unexpected circumstances. These are the things that weren't part of your American dream, your American plan, but they happened. And you didn't know they weren't gonna happen, but they happened. And you're left dealing with the brokenness. These are landmines, but can I tell you something that God revealed to me last night? You don't have to write it down, you can if you want. Our job is to put on the armor and to stand firm, yes? That, that's our job. Here's what God revealed to me. Marriages don't end because people step on landmines. Marriages end because people don't have their armor on. Because when you have your armor on, listen, you are going to step on landmines. You get two selfish people in a room long enough, there's going to be landmines all over the place. Come on. But if you have your armor on, you're protected by the grace of God. Doesn't mean there's not consequences, but it means that there is provision to keep moving forward. Marriages don't end because people go, oops. Marriages end because when people go, oops, they're not protected. Can I propose to you that we need to be people who are protected by the grace of Jesus Christ? If you're in agreement, come on and give them some praise. Check out the screen and hear a story of people who were protected by the grace of God. Born and raised in Midland, Texas. Grew up Catholic along with the rest of the Ketter family. I was raised with a ton of family, with cousins and brothers and um, grandparents who all loved the Lord and we were, we were raised in the local Baptist church in Midland. I loved Jesus as much as I knew what it meant to love Jesus. I would memorize scriptures. My mom had me in every activity. We tried to make it to church every Sunday and it slowly kind of dissipated, kind of more the back burner, like I'm, I'm, we're going for soccer, we're not going for church. So it kind of, after three or four years, just got put away in the background. I think probably at 16 and 17, I started walking away from the Lord. I graduated from high school and went to Texas Tech. You know, the Bible talks about loving God and loving people, and I would say that my college days definitely wasn't a lifestyle of loving God or loving people. Meredith's grandma has a saying in her Bible, it's kind of cool, your sin will keep you from this book, or book will keep you from sin. And um, I was kind of lost. I didn't know what to do, what to say. Um, I was just going to school, working and partying. It, it's about as simple as it gets. And I just wanted to kind of clean up my life, I guess is what you could say, and went to a a buddy's funeral, and I would say the first time I could say personally that I accepted Christ in my life. After college, I got a job in Dallas with Deloitte, and um, it was fun. I really just threw my entire identity and who I am into work. Sex in the City was a popular show back then, and I remember like, man, if I can live up to what these girls on Sex in the City are doing, then I've made it. So one weekend, I had flown home to Midland, and I was in Dillard's with my mom. We were actually looking for an Easter dress for me, and so we were in Dillard's, and I saw JR, and my mom said, man, he's cute, and so he came up, and he's like, hey, Meredith Jumper, how are you? I'm like, oh, I'm doing good, and um, he, he said, hey, I'm having a party tonight at my house. You should come, and I'm like, I'm not going to a party at JR Ketter's house. That boy's wild. I flew back to Austin, and JR, my space dream. <laughs> 
IM'd her on the old MySpace because uh, I didn't have her cell number and got that and started uh, talking about every night and ended up going down to Austin. He actually got on a plane and flew down to see me that weekend. We dated for a few months and then he actually moved to Austin. So about a year into JR moving here, we decided we were going to get married. We got married on September 11th of 09 and we had our sweet baby Jackson. Um, September 17th of 2010. Jackson came along, I think he's kind of what put a little spur back in the saddle to uh, start living life the way we knew we should. So JR and I started going to Southwest Hills Community Church and we became good friends with Sean and Elisa. A couple years in, and they called us one night and they said, hey, we're gonna come over and bring y'all pizza. Can y'all do dinner? And we said, sure. And so Sean and Elisa walked in and they said, we believe the Lord has called us to launch a church, to plant a church. And we believe the Lord um, has said that y'all should be a family to go with us. We didn't even know what he was talking about. We're like, plant a church, what does that even mean? Um, we're probably, we're for sure the most unqualified people. Well, I mean, and listen to the life story. Yeah, right? and uh, we were like, do y'all need money? But we love Sean and Elisa so much that we were like, we can't let we want to help them. We don't want them to fail. They're such great people. These were kind of a group of friends, like totally different than what we were accustomed to, I guess, or the friends that we have. And it was just like, well, huh, we're either got to ride the fence or, you know, pick a team kind of thing. And it was like either Sixth Street or Sean's house. We kind of got involved in rolling. And of course, it was like, man, this is. This is life changing and the, the puzzle pieces started coming together like we're doing this for God and to kind of help other people find the same thing that we were starting to find on our journey. The church had said, you know, our vision is obviously people, right? And they said, we're going to start these life groups. They said, hey, Meredith and JR, would y'all lead a life group? Once again, we're like, are y'all crazy? This. No. And so we were like, I mean, one thing we we can do is love people though. And so we were like, yeah. We met friends at the pool, the DeWitts, yeah. and then the Millers that moved in next door because that was God's plan. And so we, we, we finally talked all these people into coming. The Wheelers were two houses down. Everywhere we went, we we're like, we come to Vertical Chapel. We come to Vertical Chapel. And this is what I know about the Lord. And it's so true because I'd, I'd grown up in a religion, in a, in a, in an atmosphere that was like, clean it up before you get to the table. And then we started understand, understanding God's character. He's like, you don't have to hide anything, come to me. So it, it's crazy because it's like, yeah, we believed in the Lord and our lives are radically changed, but we hadn't really had to step out in true faith yet. And um, that November, JR came to me and he said, hey babe, JBK's growing, I need help um, with the business. And I feel like you're supposed to quit your job. And I remember laughing out loud in bed. I was actually working. And I remember laughing like that. He is insane. He did not hear from the Lord. He has heard from hell. I am not quitting my cush job with these great benefits. And then immediately I was convicted. And I was like, you know what? I'll pray about it. So really about two weeks later, I started praying, Lord, if this is from you, if this is your will, then I'll, I'll be obedient in that. And we, we didn't ha hadn't really told many people about what God had laid on JR's heart because we were still so scared. What if we fail? Then will Jesus look bad? What if we fail? Then is God not real? And it was all about us and failing. And so we hadn't even really shared much with our life group at that point. And at this point, they were our closest friends. So we jumped and that next day, that Monday, I gave notice and I gave 12 weeks. I, I, was, I couldn't even believe I was given notice because it's like, you know, everything that the world says you need insurance you know it's like no we have assurance but the world's like you need insurance so we had insurance we had all this and it's like i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna give it up the whole reason that spurred this thing on was that we had uh, about five contracts and for us it's a war small company but each one was about a hundred thousand for each one and uh, so that for me was just overwhelming and I was like, hey, it's time to jump on. I need some help running the inside. Um, and about the day, I guess, that we took the jump and thought we had a parachute. I think the parachute had a hole in it because <laughs> it you know, crashing and burning. It was essentially the day she kind of stepped into the office, boop, the first contract got plucked. And then about two days later, boop the next one and then so on and so forth the next thing you know all five contracts are gone for whatever reason and we're like oh, we know oh yeah. no people that were wise people that were like 
what y'all are doing is crazy. Why would you quit this great job where you ha have the sta stability? And we're like, because Jesus told us to. And that seems crazy because now, and then it's like this pride gets in the way and we're like, we're going to fail. The pressure of like this, how are we going to pay our bills? The lack of faith that we had, that we had heard from God, the lack of faith that I had, it kept me up at night. I would throw up. I would be so sick. I'm like, how are we going to do this? And so we had this huge blowout. I literally asked for a divorce that day and I'd thrown a coffee mug at Jared's head. And I mean, we just fought, fought, fought. And we, we had life group that night. We still were too, a little bit too prideful to share exactly everything because they had always said, you know, you and JR really love each other and y'all are good friends. We've never seen you fight. And so this pride of, we can't really be real with our stuff because then what are they gonna think about Jesus? And then we're, we're not worthy to lead life group. We're not worthy to even be in a life group. Who are we? We don't even believe in what we say we believe in. So I had these sunglasses on and I show up at this park and <laughs> Jesse Miller looks at me and he's like, Mayor, I'm like, and then I lose it. I'm hysterically bawling. I'm like, I don't even like JR. Our business is going to fail. We can't make it. We're a bunch of fakes. The biggest thing I regret that year is the way I walked in such fear. If I had to do it over again, just believe in that every word God says is true because I had such fear um, that we were going to be, you know, if God didn't rescue us, then we looked like idiots and God's like, I'm your father. Like he, he, when he calls us to do something, it's not about us. He used a community of, of people who are just broken people who just are chasing after Jesus who said, Ketters, we, we got your back. We're covering you when, you know, in God's word. It's like this morning he took me to Hebrews 10, just about the call to persevere in the faith, right? Don't stop meeting together to encourage each other. And I don't know that our marriage would have made it had we not had a community of people around us. For sure not. We would have just, the statistics. Yeah, sure. because these people believed in us and they, they, they came, they, you know, it's like they, we come in the name of Jesus, your father. Y'all are going to be okay. We were about to lose everything. JR called me New Year's Day of 2017 and said, I'm about to shut JBK down. There's just no money. And I thought, man, what a failure. Like, we've lost everything and we look like idiots. And JR said, I, I believe that you're supposed to pull that money out. And I was throwing up, I was sick to my stomach. I'm like, this is the only savings that we had. And I pulled out all the money. I knew the Lord was asking us to, but it was hard to be obedient. And I pulled it all out. And that afternoon, JR got the biggest contract that, and this isn't a prosperity <laughs> message. Like we, you know, it's like, no, it's God's faithfulness. It's God had a God had another plan for our life. He had a plan that impacted, that He wanted to impact people and show His hand. And I think that our story of just our that part of a little bit of testimony is God's goodness and faithfulness. It's like He was faithful when we weren't. He is good when we're not. When we came to a place where we confessed what we were doing and how we were living and the way we were talking to each other and treating each other and having friends who loved the Lord who were like, that is no. You, we're not going to have our people act like that. Get up. Get up. We got to check your heart. Both kind of learned a lot of lessons. Mine was pride and trying to swallow the pill down that day at the park. And, you know, having to tell your friends the way you treat your wife. Um, you can say one thing on Sunday, but what's the other six days look like? God rocked my world in that instance and uh, hers and another. You know, our hearts had to be right because he's like, listen, I want to bless these people and I want to use y'all to do it. Are, are you going to be obedient with a little? Now you're going to be obedient with a lot. We, we are, are the Ketters. Jesus changed our lives forever. And this is our vertical story. Come on. Come on. How many know God is good? Marriage takes hard work. Marriage takes total surrender. And here's the third one. Marriage takes amazing grace. Marriage takes the grace of God, not just directly from God, but God's love through people. And you heard it in their story that so much of the grace they needed to rest in came through God using people in their lives. We weren't created to do life alone. I, I got a question for you. Who do you have in your life 
that can pick you up and take you to Jesus when you can't take yourself? Who do you have in your life that when everything is falling apart, people will speak truth over the lies? Husbands and wives, listen to me. Something that has become abundantly clear to Elise and I is that grace is the only environment that makes forever possible. The Bible says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Listen, we confess to God to be forgiven, but we confess to people so they can come alongside of us and pray for us so that we can actually walk in the freedom that Jesus, that Jesus died to give us, amen? And I, I found this truth in the most uncomfortable season of my life because when Elisa and I got married, I was addicted to pornography. I was exposed to it at a very, very young age. I did not understand the implications of pornography, but here I am, I get saved and God is calling me to be a pastor, but I've got this secret part of my life that I don't want anybody else to know. And I hate that I'm doing it. And I would make it through a few weeks and then boom, I'd fall back. And I would make it through a few weeks and then I'd fall back. Sometimes I'd make it through a couple of months, but then I would fall back into it. And I was so addicted and so angry. I was like, Lord, I hate I hate that I'm doing this. But I don't know how to get free. See, I, at that point, I didn't have people teaching me freedom. I, I didn't have people letting me know that it is for freedom, that Christ has set you free. You're already free, but you've got to learn to walk in it. And so fast forward about seven years from that very difficult, painful place in our marriage, and we're at a conference and we're way up kind of in the nosebleed sections and worship is happening. And the Holy Spirit just said, confess to your wife. And I was like, get behind me, Satan. Come on, somebody, That's, that, that ain't the Lord. No way. That, that. I was terrified to tell her. I wasn't sure that it was an environment of grace. I was thinking if I tell her and the enemy was right there to lie to me, if you tell her, she's going to leave you. And I'm trying to block it out of my mind, block it out of my mind. I'm just gonna listen to the preacher preach. But how many of you know when you're harboring sin and you haven't obeyed the last thing that God has called you to do, it's hard to continue to hear from God. And I don't know what the world he was saying. I know it was good because people were clapping and shouting amens like you do every time I preach. Come on, somebody. And, and, but I, I'm sitting there and I'm looking at the chair in front of me. I'm like, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. But the Holy Spirit just kept overcoming me with love and conviction. And so people get up and they begin to leave and I'm staring at the chair. And at this point, I'm crying. And Elisa looks over at me and says, what's wrong? And I said, I've got to confess something to you. She says, okay. I said, for the first two years of our marriage, I was not faithful, faithful to you. I was addicted to pornography and I was ashamed of it and I tried to hide it and I tried to stop, but I just couldn't stop and I kept falling back into it and I would do everything I could and, 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 and she starts crying at which point I'm like, crap. She's gonna leave me. And I'll never forget what the enemy showed me. He showed me this like newspaper heading, another pastor's marriage fails. That's what I'm thinking in the moment. And then all of a sudden, Elisa throws her arms around me and she begins to pray for me. And I am so overwhelmed. I don't even know what to do because I was thinking her response was gonna be, I'm out. But her response reminded me so much of God. She says to me, Sean, how could I not give you grace 
when God has given me so much grace. But then she said something that blew me away. She said, and it ticked me off, it ticked, I already knew. I'm like, what? She goes, the Lord revealed it to me during the first year of our marriage, but he said, don't address it. Let me do the work in him. I want you to pray. And I want you to ask me to move in his life that he would find freedom. And she said this to me, I was never after your confession. I was after your healing. And it taught me something about the grace of God. The grace of God was moving through this woman. And I'm telling you, as she was praying for me, I heard it in the spiritual. Something broke off of my soul. And I'm telling you, from that day on, it has never been an issue. In fact, not only am I not a victim to it, I have authority to squash it in the name of Jesus. And God taught us a huge lesson that day. Write it down. You never lose when you help your spouse win. Husbands and wives, look at me for a second because it's very important. If your spouse cannot be honest with you about their sin, you are hurting your spouse more than helping them. The very definition of a helpmate is to help when you're in need of help. And can I tell you, when your spouse is struggling, there is no greater time that they need your help more than that time. How many are thankful for the grace of Jesus? Come on, how many are thankful? So Elisa and I wanted to do something today. Because here's what I need you to know, church. As we get ready to close, I need you to understand that when you stood at that altar, you did not just give empty words to God. There are these things called vows. And, and what we need you to understand is that those vows are sacred. They may not have been sacred to you, but they are sacred to the one who created marriage. And you did not step into a promise as your pastor, hear me, you stepped into a covenant. And you have the power of Jesus who is holding that covenant together. In the difficult times, you just need to lean in to Jesus. But I think sometimes the language is so formal until death parts us. And we say these things and maybe even in the moment we believe them. but we never think about the seasons where we need to act in love even when it hurts, even when we don't want to. And so Elisa and I decided to write vows using everyday language. Because can I just tell you that Elisa and I will never be effective if we're fighting this way because I'm going to lose. Come on, she grew up in the hood. She'll shank me. Come on, somebody. She'll get up in there and cat, 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 cat. Um, you don't fight this way. The Bible says, get your armor on. Do you know the only place of your body that is not protected is your back? A Roman soldier would not have protection on his back. Do you know why? Because they didn't fight this way. Let me tell you how they fought. This way. I've got your back. No matter what you go through, I've got your back. No matter what you're feeling, I've got your back. No matter what weapon forms against us, I've got your back. There is nothing that we can go through that God is not more faithful, that God is not more powerful, that God is not more good. This is who our God is. We're protected. This is how marriages fight. Not like this. Well, you did this, and you did that, and you didn't wash the dishes, and you left your socks on the floor again. I have some experience with that. Come on, somebody. <laughs> it's not how we fight. We get under the covering of God, yeah. and we grab a hold of that covenant, who is Jesus, 
And Jesus grabs a hold of us. And he says, this is how I want you to fight your battles. Keep your eyes on me. Not on the mistakes of your spouse. I can't even see the mistakes of my spouse. Because my eyes are on Jesus Christ who holds the victory. And if he's already won, this is how we fight. So let me give you some language. You ready, girl? I vow to love you with the same love that Jesus has poured out on me. I vow to honor you as the leader of our home and pray for you as you learn to lead lead like Jesus. I vow to never let the sun go down on our anger, to honor you enough to fight for unity. I vow to speak life over you, even when I'm hurting and when words of death seem more desirable. I vow to protect your heart, to call out the best in you, and to take captive every lie of the enemy. I vow to fight our battles from my prayer closet to lift us up to the one who already holds the victory. I vow to take authority over the enemy, to stand on God's truth no matter what. I vow to be your helpmate when you're struggling, to be a safe place of grace contending for your healing. I vow to make Jesus the priority of our home, that no matter what, as for our house, we will serve the Lord. I vow to be content with God's provision for our family, guarding against unhealthy pressures that come from this world. I vow to cry with you and listen to your your heart, especially when you're in the valleys of life. I vow to speak honorably of you, both in your presence and in your absence. I, I vow to be faithful to you, to never, ever give you a reason to question my loyalty or love. I vow not to be emotionally led, but to allow my emotions to be led by the Holy Spirit. I vow to make you my first ministry. Vertical Chapel is our God-given assignment, but our family will always come first. I vow to make our home a place of refuge where the joy of the Lord is our strength. I vow to never tolerate the enemy. I will lead us to shout God's goodness and to dance in his glory. I vow to be a Proverbs 31 woman who takes up the mantle as a blessing, not a burden. I vow to provide for our family and to remember that my greatest achievement is not climbing the ladder of success, but living a life of obedience. I vow to raise sharp arrows directed at Jesus to one day release them back to him. I vow to put on my armor to remember that you are not my enemy and to take all our brokenness to Jesus. I vow to not avoid conflict, but to handle conflict God's way, for we are never too broken for Jesus to restore. I vow to honor these vows. I vow to honor these vows. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poor. For richer, for poor. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. Until Jesus calls us home. Come on. Listen to me, this is the picture of marriage that the world needs to see, and it's the picture of marriage that God wants to paint in your home, regardless of what brokenness you're facing. I'm telling you that God can restore it. God can do the impossible because it's who our God is. Are you with me? If you're married, I want you to grab the hand of your spouse, and I want you to just stand to your feet right there, just stand right there. And if you're not married, here's a great time to pick a partner. Come on, somebody. I'm kidding. Kidding. Here's what I want you to do. If you are are seated and uh, beside somebody who is standing, I just want you to put your arms on that couple. Just lay your arms on that couple. And Elisa and I want to pray blessing over them. Listen, you you don't have to pray anything specific. Just put your arms on them. And we're going to pray together. Come on, let's go to God. Say, Father, we know that you are faithful. And we know that you are bigger than our hurt. You are bigger than our sin. You are bigger than our brokenness. Lord, I speak life over every marriage right now in the name of Jesus Christ. 
And Satan, I command you to leave right now in Jesus' name. You have no legal right. These people who are standing have been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. And he is forced to pass over. God, I pray that every person standing right now, they would feel the healing power of the Holy Spirit. Even for those who would say today that their marriage is healthy, God, I thank you that there is always a step further that we can take with you. Lord, I pray for the person who's been through the pain of divorce. God, I pray that you would comfort them. Lord, I pray that you would remind them that their life will not be defined by divorce. It will be defined by you. That their best days are still ahead of them. God, I thank you that you are the faithful one who started the good work in us. Come on, tell them. Say, God, I believe that you've started it. And I believe that you are faithful to bring it to completion. Come on, tell them. Lord, whatever you're asking us to do from this message, our answer is yes. Search me, O oh God, and test my thoughts. See if there's any grievous way in me. And God, whatever you find, our answer is yes. Come on, just tell him right now. My answer is yes. Thank you for forgiveness. Come on, tell him thank you for forgiveness. And thank you for complete healing. And tell the Lord, tell him right now, I will not settle for anything less than your best. God, we're not after a good marriage. We're after a blessed marriage. We're after a marriage that has been touched by heaven, that is set apart, that is consecrated by the very blood of Jesus Christ. And I thank you that every single person in this room can have a God-honoring, blessed marriage because of the power and faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we stand in that promise with our armor on. We will not be moved because the foundation for our lives, Jesus Christ, is unshakable. And we ask this in the all-powerful name of Jesus. Come on, and we all shout it out. Amen. Amen. Come on and give God praise.